Hi everybody, I'm Scott and today I want to take a look at the Unihertz Titan phone. It's a QWERTY keyboard phone in the style of an old Blackberry. It's supposed to be super rugged and it has decent specs, although it only runs Android 9, although it seems to be upgradable to 10 after the fact. So uh, yeah, let's, uh, let's take a look at it. It comes in rather unassuming packaging that matches my table pretty well and uh, pretty unassuming on the inside too, but we get right to well, the reason we're here, the phone, which doesn't want to come out of its home. There we go. Now, this sure is a big chunker of a phone. I mean, like, my hands are relatively big. And, uh, yeah, that's, that's pretty much a handful for me. Um, as far as for scale, well, I don't know. Here's a small keyboard with sort of like regular size keys. So hopefully that gives you an idea of the size of it. It's actually taller than this fairly small keyboard. But like I said, those are the same size keys you'd find on any other keyboard. So hopefully that does it for you for scale. I only need better stuff for scale. Um, uh, here's like a normal size drill. So I don't know. Anyway. Oh, wait. I should use other phones. Here it is next to a Pixel 5, which is a relatively small phone. It's about the same height, but significantly wider. And here it is with a Surface 2 Duo, which actually dwarfs it by a little bit. Not that this is a very common phone, so that probably won't help you out too much. But it's that this was this is on the larger side, and hence so is this. This phone is meant to be rugged, and it sure has the looks for it. It's got like metal plating on the sides and on the back. It looks like an industrial phone. And this was a Kickstarter, by the way, apparently. I don't know if it was by an established company or just uh something brand new that came up now they have a whole line of phones though so i'm not sure if this was the first um or not but yeah it is it does seem pretty well made at least and just right off the bat i mean the keyboard does seem usable like there was some blackberries back in the day that really had tiny ass chiclet keys that i could barely touch but the good thing about the big size of this phone is that it has relatively large keys which is good for me the reason I even decided to look into this phone is because my wife is always complaining to me about, well, smartphones and touchscreens. She, I don't know, very anachronistic, but she longs for the days of Blackberries to return, or at least phones with uh, slide out keyboards or uh, tactile keyboards of some sort. So I figured maybe this would be a good phone for her. I think this is a little too big. However, it does seem that Unihertz has come out with the Titan Pocket, which is a pocket version of this and quite a bit smaller. So, yeah, and a little bit cheaper, too. And not that expensive. And this one runs Android 11, which is still one version behind. But, yeah, it, it, it's, I mean, it's not a bad-looking phone in, like, I said, sort of an industrial design sort of way. And by industrial, I mean, like, heavy industry, not like, you know, Apple's industrial design. But anyway, really quick, let's take a look at the specs for the phone we actually have here, which is this. It retails for 339 I got it on sale on Banggood for, I think, 350 ish uh, Right now it's running for 460 which seems expensive. But, um, but the problem is if you, if you select the U.S. region, it's marked as sold out. So you have to get like a Chinese region phone uh, if you want one from their site. So U.S. region phone you can get on Banggood for 460 bucks, which seems high to me. But the specs on this thing are not terrible. So first of all, it claims to be IP6 radiated water resistant, so you can spill water on it. That's great. That actually is great. I mean, I'm not. I sound sarcastic, but that's actually uh, fantastic. If you accidentally drop your phone in a puddle or spill a drink on it, it has. It takes two SIMs, which is actually pretty unusual today, at least in, in U.S. phones. In fact, everyone's moving to soft SIMs. So six gigs of RAM. I mean, not bad. You know, today's like flagship phones have about 12 gig in them. Um, Android 10, I think it's field upgradable or over the air upgradable, uh, eight core, two gigahertz, which isn't bad either. Six amp hour battery. I mean, it depends how badly this consumes the battery and actually a fairly high resolution screen. All told the camera, I'm going to guess is going to be disappointing, but we'll, we shall see. And, uh, yeah, it supports plenty of bands and of course, Wi-Fi, Bluetooth, GPS and GLONASS, uh, front mounted fingerprint sensor, which I like. So it has all the features. I mean, this, this definitely seems on paper like a great phone, um, despite its chunkiness. But I mean, the chunkiness is kind of deserved. And like I said, helps with the keyboarding.
Well, enough faffing around. I think it's time to get the uh, screen protector off, which comes in a nice blue color, as well as this top uh, protective plastic. Ooh. Is there anything protective on the back? No. Well, there's this sticker with the uh, IEMI information, and it gives two IEMIs for both uh, SIM slots. Now, the age-old question, does it ship with a battery charge? And is this the power button that I'm pressing? Nope, that's the power button on the right side. It seemed like the red button should be the power button, but I'm going to guess that's the camera button, maybe. Nice, bright, and vivid screen. I mean, it's very bright in here, like the ambient lighting, and you can see that very clearly. Uh, I've had a lot of problems with screens not showing up at all or being very dim here. So, uh, yeah, this, this is quite nice, actually. Connect to mobile network if you have SIM cards, insert them now. I do have a SIM card from Google Fi because I have Google Fi, and it's only 15 bucks a month extra to add another member, and I think it's prorated so I can test this out for like a week or so uh, with that SIM card, and it won't cost me too much. So let's skip. It is, of course, touchscreen. It's not just keyboarded. And actually, bef before I enter my full Wi-Fi password, I'm just playing around with this, and it's, it's taken me some getting used to to move back to a tactile keyboard. Um, there's no dedicated number key, so I have to hit the Alt key to get a number there. I mean, fortunately, they do provide number keys virtually on the screen, which is nice, as well as some symbols. So I do appreciate, like, the hybrid sort of uh, approach to this. And uh, that's definitely, a, right, up, right up front, that's a good design choice, is to give that hybrid approach. But, um, yeah, it's almost like, for me, texting on an old-school phone where you have to hit, like, the same number numerous times to get a letter out of it. Even though it's not that, it's like it's giving me that f flashbacks to that, even though it's a full key QWERTY keyboard. Yeah, I mean, so it's a long password, and even by the time I got to, towards the end of the password, I was already much more comfortable with the keyboard. Like, so it, I, I was really getting used to it quickly. Um, and to their credit, it's, it's a good layout. It has a good feel to it. Oh, no, checking for updates. And it actually shipped with 56% battery, so that's cool. Um, plenty for this setup purposes and just testing it out. And fortunately, you don't have to sit here and watch it wait for updates. I do. Actually, while this is waiting for updates, um, oh, it seems to be done, but let's take a look at what's in the box. So we got a Euro-style power adapter. I hope this isn't made for a Euro cell phone frequencies. This is supposed to be the U.S. model, so I'm a little concerned about that. Uh, we got a pair of wired earbuds, the old school kind, with the microphone in the cord. Eh, not so useful nowadays. I don't know who wouldn't want to use it with Bluetooth headphones, but... You know, cool. You get flashbacks to 2010. And, of course, an USB charging cable that is type A to type C. And it is about a meter long. I would call it maybe under a meter, but just slightly. And that's just eyeballing it. I don't know. Nothing crazy is my point. And, of course, we get a little packet of documentation. Oh, well, shit. Was I not supposed to take that blue screen protector off? No, it says... Oh. Oh, please peel off this mask after application is completed. Okay, so it peeled off the blue covering, the blue coating for the actual screen coating that remains attached. All right. Never mind. Ha. Huh. I thought I screwed up there, but that is just fine. So it comes with an extra screen protector, which is nice, and a user guide, which is in English in the front, and... Chinese in the back, and some other languages too. Ah, it's also uh, got some German in there. So English, Chinese, and German. Cool. Nothing, uh, nothing earth-shattering here. It just like tells you what parts of the phone there are and how to eject the SIM card, which you know is probably pretty straightforward. And yeah, that's uh, that's about it. So I think what I'm going to ultimately do is dare my wife to use this as her daily driver for a little while. But uh, that would, of course, require, well, she doesn't have a physical SIM card, so that would require getting a physical SIM card for her and getting her set up on Android. So I'm not going to do that right now. I'm just going to sign in under sort of a uh, Google test account that I have. It's, it's a real account. It's just one I don't use. It's one I use for business and not so much for personal stuff. And it's perfect for testing because it doesn't have a lot of crap preloaded on it. So let me log into that. Okay, I'm going to give the uh, fingerprint sensor setup a try. Seems to be uh, working, detecting my fingerprint properly, or at least as far as the setup is concerned. Google Assistant is so unnecessary. 
All right, straight to the home screen. Looks pretty nice. For some reason it started on the third page, like it just installed something, but okay. That's weird, the back button is on the right and the task switch button is on the left. Huh, okay. I mean, easy to get used to. I gotta say, like, I'm already digging this uh, tactile keyboard. That was a quick install, cool. What is that? It's like a buffalo. Oh, wireless update, okay, cool. Actually, let's see what that wireless update is first before I continue. Okay, it's only an 86 megabyte download, so probably not too huge. It says shake to download. Uh, okay, how about you just download it? I don't know, the watch had the shake to download on it, and then a watch, I guess that makes sense, because, you know, you could just shake it easily, but... On the phone, I don't know how that helps as opposed to just clicking a download button. Weird. Oh, one thing I forgot to point out is that with the literature was the SIM card removal tool. So it's convenient that they included that. Although, you can just use a small paper clip. I mean, you don't really need a special tool for that at all. But if you don't have a paper clip handy, obviously having this come with the phone is even better. And if anyone's wondering, it's updating to version 2021-05-21. So presumably from May 21st of this year. Although it is, does have an underscore that then goes to June 10th of this year. So it's about six months old, this update. No, the release date is June 10th. It says it right below there. Whoopsie, I was looking at the uh, version number. They have a thing about reversing. Like, the install now is on the left and install later is on the right. I would think the install now should be on the right, like the OK button is. Although maybe they want you to sort of to default mentally to installing later, just so you don't accidentally make your phone unusable for a period of time. Oh, you know what? I just realized when I pulled the, it says, please peel off this mask after application completed. When I pulled this off by, via this tab, the entire thing came up, but actually it did bring the screen protector out with it because there are two layers there. Now, I didn't realize that, and it came off the screen much easier than the blue came off the clear. So, uh, yeah, just a little awkward there, but I don't blame myself on that one because you pull the tab, it should take off what it's supposed to take off not the whole thing, but it doesn't matter. I mean, it's protecting a glass screen. I, I think I'm okay with this uh, being unprotected for now, at least. I can always apply the other one it came with. Maybe that's why they included another one, is because people were constantly just peeling off the whole thing, getting the back of it all, you know, dusty as I already have, and making this unusable in the process. So this is like watching paint dry, of course, but I want to make sure I have the latest software on here. Hey, the update, she is complete for like a... Um, 86 megabyte download that was a pretty lengthy install process took about five minutes okay not the longest in the world but longer than i thought it would that's a fun little logo nice lengthy boot time though Jeez. now that definitely wasn't a full android version upgrade so what did this come with as far as the uh version of android goes uh updated to android 10 so it's already updated to 10 okay that's cool. I thought it was going to come with 9, because on the Banggood listing it originally had said this comes with Android 9, and it would have taken an OTA update to get it to 10, but uh, cool. Alright, so I guess let's insert the old SIM card and just see if that process has anything weird to it. I doubt it will. I actually like to try this with multiple SIMs, but unfortunately I don't have SIMs to spare for this. This use one large SIM and one... Oh no, it takes an SD card or a SIM card in the second slot. Interesting. Okay. Well, anyway, that's unfortunate. So you can either expand the storage or expand it to multiple SIMs. Eh. So yeah, just for clarity, here it shows in the SIM carrier, you can put two SIM cards like that and like that, or you can put one SD card there, and then presumably you still have a SIM there because it needs at least one SIM card to work. But uh, yeah, the second slot is SIM or SD. Very, that's unfortunate. And like I said, this SIM carrier is very fiddly. And it doesn't want to go in with the SIM in there. Like the SIM is laying flat on this thing. But as soon as I try to push it in, it doesn't want to move any further and I don't want to risk breaking it. But if I pop the SIM out, I'm definitely putting this, this carriage in the right way.
There we go. It, for some reason, that time it decided to cooperate. Okay, as a reminder, this phone has been fully tested on Phi, but most features work as intended. Sure, good. Activating. Let's hope it activates and works on the U.S. cellular network. I don't mean U.S. cellular. That's actually a brand. I mean the cellular network in the U.S., which in this case is probably T-Mobile, which is now Sprint, but whatever. Okay, well, Phi still says it's activating, but it also says that it assigned me a new phone number that's ready to use, which... Uh, you can see there, I'm going to try an experiment. I'm going to leave this phone with this phone number on for like a couple of days after the video is published. And then I'm going to get rid of this phone number. So please don't call it um, after this video has been published for a little while because I probably don't own that number anymore and someone else does. So, you know, um, do be nice to them. But for now, if you want to try calling me, uh, try calling this number and see if you get me. I don't know. Weird experiment, right? But... Uh, why not with this test phone? And we can see how we can see how well it works together, voice-wise. All right, so it says it's set up for uh, for voice and data. So let me disconnect the Wi-Fi. I actually like the dialer too. I'm going to try testing it out by dialing my uh, regular phone. But uh, before I dial the phone number, I just want to show you that it comes up with the keypad on the side here, and you could also use the tactile keys if you want to. So it gives you the option. And I do like that because it is easier to use the touchscreen for dialing numbers, I think, because the layout's what you're familiar with. You don't have to keep hitting the Alt key to get the numbers on this uh, keypad here. But uh, yeah, to each their own. You can do either one, either way you want. And I like the flexibility of that. Yeah, though. Ah, so that seems to work. Uh, why can I not hear myself on the unihertz? I'm not muted. What the hell? Call volume? No, the in-call volume is maximum. Okay, so I don't want to show you the front of these phones right now because uh, I'm on a call with myself, but um, and you'd see the phone numbers. But the weird thing is I'm not getting any audio output from the unihertz. But the call is clearly connected because I could hear myself from the unihertz to this phone, but not the other way around. I don't know. That could be a call issue or that could be a unihertz issue. I'm not uh, not exactly sure. Uh, speaker? Oh, maybe the speakerphone was on? No. What the, what the hell? Uh... Okay, well, I got a notification from Chrome saying your web page is ready, so I guess it did end up connecting to data after all. So you, the YouTube homepage is loading up just fine. I'm not logged in right now. I have no idea what any of this crap is. Well, the speed test download is proceeding very slowly, so that's not encouraging, but it's showing I'm getting like one micro bar of service down here. On my regular phone, I actually get pretty decent service in the basement. Not great, but I would say more than half bars, but now it's like showing barely any service but it clearly is connecting it clearly is working with data so and it does say 4g so it is compatible with 4g on google fi as for the call issue i'll have to give that a try again and get to the bottom of it okay let's see google fi speed test in the basement won't necessarily be the best but uh okay almost eight megabit that's actually not bad considering in the basement the service is not stellar. Okay, topped out at 9 megabit. I'm fine with that. I think that in the... Uh, oh, the upstream is terrible, though. But I think I'm okay with that, because like I said, I'm in the basement. The service is not great down here. So uh, I'd imagine if I went upstairs or just outside, this would perform a lot better. But clearly, it is connecting. It is working at 4G speeds, at least. And this is not a 5G phone, so I wouldn't expect 5G speeds out of it. So, uh, yeah. I would say that's uh, that's adequate. You? Oh, there we go. Okay. This time the phone is connected. And uh, I'm holding the Unihertz earpiece up, so you should hear a little echo. But that's, uh, that's the phone working. Hooray. All right. Well, sorry I had to just stare at a table for a minute, but the Unihertz is working completely fine now as far as voice calls go. I didn't know that's what the red button on the side is for. I just hit the red button on the side this guy during the call and it came up with this message telling me voice recording files will be stored in internal storage which may later be accessed by another application continue so that's a record button when you're in the phone that's that's interesting i kind of like that actually oh there's a start recording button here in the middle too okay i like that recording function and the ease of accessing it I don't usually record phone calls, especially not personal ones, but when I call into customer service centers, 
you know, the kind that say your call may be recorded for quality assurance purposes. I like to record those calls just because if you don't get follow through on with them, that's uh, just a good thing to have in your pocket to make sure that you actually communicated properly with them and that they're the ones who dropped the ball. And, you know, it says this calls me recorded anyway. So there's no legal issue. Both parties know they're being recorded. So, you know, that's fine. Uh, recording personal conversations, you can get in trouble doing that. They're interpersonal conversations, even professional conversations. Um, if the other person doesn't know they're being recorded in certain states or certain countries. So, uh, yeah, the laws can be uh, difficult, but I generally don't want to record my personal conversations, but um, business conversations with call centers, definitely. So I can later, if they don't follow through and don't do what they promised to do, I can post it in the voice uh, call to Twitter and say, ha ha, you guys, uh, you guys screwed up. I don't know, but that's just me. If, if you've ever seen my Twitter account, you know it's just a dumping ground for my anger at corporations. I never get angry with customer service people because they're just doing their jobs, you know, they, they have to suck it up dealing with shitty customers all the time. So I always try not to be one of those shitty customers. But I vent my anger at the corporation on Twitter. And I know there's a social media person behind that account who has to read it. I'm never like so mean that it's unbelievable. I mostly just shit on their products, not so much the uh, people, you know. But hey, that's what Twitter's for, right? I guess. Let's turn on to dark theme. Dark theme is better than light theme. All right, so it seems like a nicely functional phone. I mean, like, except for one part where it got a little jittery for a second, like, it's actually running nice and smooth. It's running Android 10. I mean, I don't need to get into the features and, um, you know, controls with Android 10, because that's common. Uh, let's see how the camera is, though. Okay, I was able to deny its, its request to access the location. Uh, let's see what I can take a picture of. I'm going to take a picture of this camera. Um, well, that's actually not bad. I prefer to get some like landscape photography to check this out with, but and let's see what if I reverse it. Oh, the front facing camera is not bad either. I, I mean, it's not fantastic, but I think it's only eight megapixels. So it, it uh, yeah, that's not bad, right? I mean, even though it's a relatively simple test photograph, it's not of anything terribly interesting, but yeah. There's a couple more. So, um, and what about low light? Let me just uh, find a darker area. It's actually, okay, like I'm taking this picture right now. That's outside the scope of the main lights down here. And that's really not bad. Um, oh, all right. I can turn shit off with my uh, new DXM. Let me turn the lights down. Hmm. All right, so now I just have the rear lighting on, and you can see how dim it is in here. I'm going to take a picture of the camera again that's next to me. That's not bad at all. Okay, let me take a look, picture of the servers behind me. Hopefully you can see the phone screen. Yeah, I mean, those aren't super dim, and I'm sorry, it's at a weird angle, but yeah. Camera on this is not half bad. I mean... And it's really dark. Oh, wow. It's really dark over there. Okay. This is one of those cases where it's darker to my eye than it is to the phone. And, um, you know, it's not great. It's grainy, of course. But light's coming back on. Watch your eyes. But, yeah. Um, the camera's better than I expected. I, I got to give it credit. Um, it's not, like, the best camera I mean, the Pixel phones have pretty good cameras, and I've always been impressed with those, and especially Google, Google's image processing, which is done in the camera app. And I was, I'm actually not even, is this, this isn't even the Google camera app. So, yeah, I'm, uh, I'm quite pleased with the cameras on this, um, considering what it is. Yeah. So I think next step for this phone is I'm going to test it out a little myself in real life and just play around with its functionality. And I'm going to see if my wife wants to use it. If she wants to use it, I'll get her a SIM card. I'll get her accounts and stuff loaded up on this and um, let her use it and come back with my verdict. Well, I guess right now, because, of course, in real life, this is going to take a few days. But uh, in editing, it's like magic. OK, it's not magic. Everyone knows how editing works. I mean, it's just like you're going to see what happens later right now. And I'm going to have to wait till later to see what happens later because real life sucks like that. You can't just skip forward. Well, that sure was magical. Um, it's been, I think four days since I recorded that 
and I've had time to play around with the Unihertz Titan phone and uh, get some real impressions of it. I didn't make it my daily driver because obviously my phone number is associated with my other phone. I didn't feel like transferring that. I have tons of apps. I didn't feel like loading every single one of those apps onto this phone, but I loaded a, the apps I use most like Amazon, eBay, uh, a couple of email apps and some other things onto this phone so that I could use it. If not as my daily driver, as like for the most part, as, as often as possible, I would use this phone instead of my regular phone. Overall, I'm not switching to this phone. That's my ultimate conclusion is that it, first of all, I don't need the tactile keyboard as much as some people might, or I don't want it as much as some people might. Uh, but also I found that the tactile keyboard for me anyway, and maybe it's just because I'm not used to it, maybe after using it for a month or you know a little bit of time, my hands would get used to it. But I found my hands cramping up. I tried to take notes on my impressions on the phone itself in the notes app. And I ended up actually just moving to the computer to take notes because um, it was just typing long sentences or paragraphs was just too, too crampy on the hands. Um, and that's just me. I mean, everyone has different uh, tolerances for that sort of thing, different th things they find comfortable. So just for me, that was an issue. You know, it's, it's sort of like the weight of the phone combined with the, the spacing of the keyboard. Like for me, it just didn't do it. The other thing I found incredibly awkward is the one to one aspect ratio of the screen. So like when scrolling through Amazon, for example, whereas usually you'd see multiple items on the portrait orientation, like down the whole screen on this, you really only saw like two items wide in the list view. And so it was kind of, it was like it was zoomed in all the time because apps aren't really designed for a one to one aspect ratio screen. I mean, almost no phone has that. So they're all designed either for portrait or landscape. And besides that, it makes content that's made for either of those orientations um, also difficult on this screen, like Instagram, for example, which is really set up for portrait. And again, it, when you're scrolling, it's almost like as if you're zoomed in because it's showing you too much uh, width, not enough height on the content, if you know what I mean. Also for watching YouTube videos, the YouTube video takes up the entire top of the screen while the interface and the like dislike button are still at the bottom and stuff, which is fine if you want to, interact with that kind of thing, but you can't get like a real full screen view because the aspect ratio is wrong, whether the content is in portrait or landscape. So you're always going to have only part of the screen filled with video. And it doesn't matter which way you rotate it because a one by one screen or a one to one aspect ratio screen, it's the same either way. So there's no point in rotating the phone at all because that just rotates the keyboard out of your uh, out of reach. One thing of note that was kind of random, I recorded the video on December 12th and then on December 16th, I got an update for the November 3rd version of the firmware. So it took a while for like that firmware version to pop up. I don't know why that comes from the manufacturer and not Google. So it's not like, you know, Google rolls out updates over time. I figured Unihertz would push the updates out as soon as they're available to all their phones. So it's weird that I got um, an update that was like a month and a half old after using the phone for a few days. So I don't know what was up with that. Just figured I'd mention it. Um, also a real, real deal killer for me with this phone is that it doesn't fit nicely in my pocket. Now, they do make the Titan pocket version of this phone, which is clearly meant to overcome that by being smaller, but I, I don't wear skinny jeans. I mean, I wear relatively baggy jeans and it, it literally does fit in the pocket, but it makes the pocket so bulky and awkward that it's, it's very uncomfortable. And it's just like, it doesn't fit well. It's, you know, even the standard, like larger smartphone, like an iPhone uh, 13 max. I've had that in my pocket and even that's like a little chunky, but this is just because of the width of it, I think is just beyond the uh, comfortable. One major plus for me with this phone, and it's kind of a pet peeve of mine, is that the phone is designed to be rugged from the start. Like it's got, you know, it doesn't have glass right to the edges, first of all. So you don't have to worry about like something hitting the edge and hitting the glass. It's also got, you know, rugged eyes, like metallic bumpers on the side. And overall, it feels very solid. It is a very solid feeling phone. It does have like that feeling of quality to it. And it does feel like if you drop it, it's not going to break on you. Uh, and I like that because, I mean, first of all, putting a case on this phone would get kind of ridiculous. Like that would make the phone even bigger. But second of all, I always find it bizarre that Apple, Google, um, who, uh, Samsung, whoever else, they spend tons of money on design to make their phones look just just so the way they want it. And then everyone ends up slapping a case on it because they end up making it relatively fragile and it's so expensive. You want to protect it with the case. I mean, 
I used to be against cell phone cases sort of on a meta on a uh, philosophical level but now I have one on my phone just because it's so delicate you drop it once onto like concrete it's done for you know a lot of phones have glass on the front glass on the back like why glass on the back like yes it gives it a premium feel but you basically have to cover it with a case so anyway rant aside that, that's my feeling on cases I just wish they'd make phones rugged in the first place with a nice design and this of course is a matter of taste I kind of like the um, hardcore industrial aspect of it other people of course might not but uh, that's a matter of personal taste and it doesn't matter what your personal taste is with modern phones because they all kind of look the same and you're going to put a case on it anyway so I do I do like this phone that it's actually trying to be its own thing and trying to look unique and also be rugged on its own so that's that's a major plus for me as far as uh, their design goes another thing that's not really worth it for me on the phone is losing out on screen real estate like the keyboard obviously takes up what would be screen on a normal phone of this size and for me a, a tactile keyboard isn't as important as that screen as that extra screen real estate is for some people of course it might be it's a trade-off obviously just remember you're carrying around a much larger phone and basically a lot of that is keyboard so you're making some sacrifice to have the tactile keyboard I think that's obvious but I just thought I'd mention it another sort of positive about the design this red button is a multi-function button first of all if the phone isn't doing anything or if you're not in an app that uses that button it acts as a flashlight activation button if you hold it down for a couple seconds and I really like that because having a flashlight handy is uh, is excellent in the camera app it functions as a camera shutter button in the phone app as we saw before it starts recording the call and I'm sure it could be used with other apps too I haven't found another use for it but um, obviously those are two pretty good convenient ones to have now I said earlier that the camera app is not the traditional Google camera app the weird thing is it does have lens functionality which I thought was Google proprietary so maybe it is the Google camera app with a different icon but then again it has a pro mode to it and that pro mode I haven't seen on a regular Google phone so I'm not sure exactly what the camera app is but it does work well and it does seem like a good app I like it uh, overall the fingerprint reader is centered right in the middle of the phone here and that also acts as a home button but as you can see it's a bit inconsistent I did read my fingerprint in a couple of times and it did you know I registered all angles of the print and yet I have to catch it in certain angles at certain times like sometimes it will take a direct tap on the center to unlock it but just before it did not so I'm not sure what's up with that the fingerprint reader is a bit inconsistent but um, overall you know it's, it's a convenient position and I like where it is your thumb just sort of rests there naturally and that also acts as the home button to get you back to the home screen which is a nice thing to have a minor niggle but the uh, keyboard does not the keyboard is backlit but it doesn't light up when the screen lights up it only lights up when you're typing and even that is a bit inconsistent like sometimes in the middle of typing like without much pause between key presses the backlight would just turn off and stay off for another few key presses and then come back on I don't that's probably a firmware issue it might get fixed in the future but that's just a little bit of an oddity I found and in a dark room it can be kind of um, difficult to get started typing because unless you really get a feel for the keyboard and touch typing on it the backlight on the keyboard is not on until you start typing something so like if you want to type B you would have to find the T key before the backlight turns on and only when you press it does the backlight actually come on and then you can keep typing easily in the dark like I said kind of a minor thing but I found it to be an actual inconvenience when in the dark I mean getting used to the keyboard would help and I once I got used to the layout I'd probably be able to start typing on it no problem the keyboards also a little spongy it doesn't have like if you remember the old school blackberries with like the individual raised keys that were sort of spaced apart like those keys had a solid feel like you were typing almost on a real keyboard just miniaturized these keys have that spongy like miniaturized membrane key feel that's just not pleasant to type on and sometimes some of the keys feel like they're getting stuck like when I raise my finger like half a second after I, li I lift my finger off the key it'll make a little clicking noise like it's popping all the way up like it was stuck down although it doesn't repeat type anything so I don't think it's actually stuck I think it's just like the way it's manufactured it's just like a bit low tolerance maybe I don't know what the right word for it is but it it's just a bit spongy and a bit uncomfortable to type on for that reason in addition to like the the weight of it and sort of the awkward hand positioning 
again, for me, your opinion might differ. Everyone has their own uh, likes and dislikes when it comes to keyboards. Believe me, I know that. Um, the autocorrect it uses, at least for the main keyboard, is not Google standard autocorrect. So like certain words it was struggling with, and it just wasn't auto-completing the way I would expect it to. And it was giving sort of odd autocomplete suggestions and sort of very specific ones. Like it didn't quite understand if you hit the wrong letter that you actually meant a different word that's spelled almost the same way. It sort of went very literally from the first letter to the second letter to the third letter to find something to autocomplete. Whereas Google's autocomplete is more like if you type, if you're trying to type there as in T-H-E-I-R and you type T-R-E-I-R, it'll usually like figure that out and correct it. This will not. It'll give suggestions starting with T-R and that's it. So I guess Unihertz is using some kind of proprietary or homegrown autocomplete, which is not that great. I think it's just simply dictionary based. And that's autocomplete slash autocorrect, same, same deal. This I found to be a weird one. Very early on, I went to listen to a YouTube video and the sound was very low, so I jacked it up all the way. And then I still really couldn't hear it too well. And then I moved my hand off the back of the phone and suddenly I heard it very well because I was holding the phone like this. The speakers are on the rear of the phone down here, which is a really odd placement in my opinion, because first of all, I mean, obviously they're not front facing. So when you're watching a video or something, you don't hear the sound coming from the direction of the video sort of coming from underneath. Now you can, the best thing to do is cup your hand so the sound sort of reflects off your hand out the front. But if you're holding with your hand flat against the bottom, it just muffles it, which is sort of like the natural position to hold it while watching a video. So, or you can hold it, you know, sort of like this and just let the sound blast out the back. But you know, then to hear it yourself properly, you really need to crank up the volume, which would disturb someone sitting over there. I mean, not that you should really be you know, watching YouTube videos without headphones um, in public. But, you know, it, it, it's unnecessarily bothersome to have the speakers pointing that way. Just uh, just odd. So, yeah, that's that's my impression of the Unihertz Titan. Um, it's not a bad phone. It, it's it's well designed. Like, they clearly put thought into it. It's just some parts of it are just, I don't know, deal breakers for me. I mean, I think... For me, the entire concept of a tactile keyboard is a deal breaker nowadays. I, I've just gotten used to having a touchscreen keyboard. My wife, Amanda, she didn't want this phone. It was too big. She has fairly small hands. I did order the Unihertz Titan Pocket so that she could try it out. And so I'd also I can, you know, do a side by side comparison video about the two phones. And that might be a lot more to her liking. And she really values a tactile keyboard. So for her, she might be okay with the sort of trade-offs involved in having a tactile keyboard. But ultimately, I mean, you know, I, I liked a tactile keyboard when I had one. And when smartphones of the, you know, just touchscreen only type came out, I, I was also bitterly disappointed and I really wanted my tactile keyboard back. As time went on, as I'm sure most people uh, did, I got used to it. And now I'm fine with the touchscreen keyboard. And I kind of forgot about the trade-offs. So I, I was a little bit excited, like tactile keyboard. Okay, maybe I'll like that a lot better and, you know, I'll really get into it. But I, I forgot about how smartphones have evolved for, uh, to be the shape and size they are for a sort of reason. And I know they come in multiple different sizes, like you can get large and small smartphones, but I think that accommodates people with different size hands, with different size, you know, pockets, different ways they want to store the phone as they go around. But overall, the ergonomics of it, just having a flat slab of screen, I think makes sense nowadays and it didn't make sense or at least it wasn't a thing you know before 2006 or whenever it was when we all had blackberries and this was the norm and everything was made for a one by one screen but i think the aspect ratio of the screen is really really a problem nowadays and surprisingly so i i didn't anticipate it being that much of an issue well anyway thanks for watching uh that was my look at the unihertz titan phone the titan pocket i'll be reviewing shortly and uh, thanks for watching. See you later.